Good morning. There you go. There you go. God is good. Amen. How many is glad to be in the house today? All right. Well, there we go. There we go. Praise God. How many is glad that he is in the house this morning? Amen. We serve such an awesome God. We serve. He is so good. Uh, just uh, I'm amazed at how good he is. I, um, I've been serving him for about 32 years. I know I was like three when I got saved. So, you know, that was a joke. Yeah, never mind. Anyway, now I'm a little older than that. But it, I, would, I have, um, you know, I guess to say, has God always given me everything that I want? No. Do I ever regret serving God? No. I didn't know that life could be this way. I didn't know that even how good God's grace and his mercy and his love is and to truly what that means to be forgiven. How many of you know that that's the word that, that, that separates us from the world is that one word is forgiven, right? That's the only difference is we're human. We go through things, and, but we are forgiven because of what Jesus did upon the cross. And I, um, and I brought my, in case you decide to throw something at me, I brought my own stones I can throw back, so just be careful. And probably if you're, if you're sitting next to the person that I would have to throw at, you may want to die. I'm not the best thrower in the world, so it may, who knows where it may go. I'm just kidding. But uh, this message was uh, kind of, uh, how do I word it? You know, I had a message all written up and ready to go, and, and I'll use it somewhere down the line, but I just really feel like God, the Holy Spirit, just laid something a little different on my heart. And last night, poor Andrea, she always waits for my stuff, and I'm always like, okay, God, is this it? You know, because I want to, I mean, I understand that God knows exactly what every one of us is going through right now. He knows exactly what you need. He's not surprised. Nothing is hidden from God. And the good news is, though, even in the midst of all that and our mistakes sometimes and the things that we mess up, that he loves us anyway. Isn't that good news? And because of what Jesus did on the cross and if I was going to title that, and I guess I did title it, but it, is there not a cause? Is there a reason why we do what we do? What is the reason behind why Grace City Owensville is doing what it's doing? Is there a reason why behind you and I as individuals? How many knows that this building is not the church? That we are the church. This building is just a tool that we use, just like a carpenter uses a hammer or a school teacher uses the the computers, I started to say chalkboard, but never mind, they don't use chalkboards anymore. Um, I miss those days. But, um, you know, there's a reason why, there should be a reason why we're doing what we're doing. And I, and I say that to say, you know, I would imagine when Grace City started over here, just like in Bourbon, there was probably people that said, oh, why are we building another church? Why do we need this? Why do we need that? There's so much going on. I truly believe and I'm, you got a you got a great team over here, in the pastor that you have, but in the praise and worship team, the ones that are that are leading, man, they've got a heart that's hungry for God. That's a good thing, church. Corey didn't start Grace City just so he could have a platform, because the only platform that we have is Christ. He's the only foundation that we can build on. So today I'm going to read a quick scripture and I'm going to give you some, some backstory in a moment. But 1 Samuel chapter 17, and I'm just going to read two scriptures and they're going to kind of sound like, you know, that's kind of in the middle of something. But then I'm going to backtrack and talk to you for just a moment. 1 Samuel 17 says this in verse 28. It says, now Eliab, the oldest brother, heard he spoke to the, man, to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. David's his younger brother. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep? Now, I want you to remember those words, that few sheep in the wilderness. Remember those words. I know your pride and your insolence of your heart. For you have come down here to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Church, is there not a cause while we're doing what we're doing in Owensville, Missouri? Look at our nation. Our nation, at the end of the day, we're not battling against flesh and blood. 
even though the enemy would love for us to step out into that, and we do it at times. I've done, I've been there. This is not a physical battle that we are in. It is a spiritual battle that we are in. The Bible says, what well, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities in high places. There is a spiritual war going on that wants to destroy. The enemy can only do three things. Steal, kill, and destroy. That's all the enemy knows how to do. He can't tell the truth. He can't make good. He can't do good. He's out to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants to destroy our nation. How does he do that? He does that by destroying the family. And how does he destroy the family? He does that by destroying individuals. How many understand the enemy's got a plan for, you know, the Bible says that God has a plan for our life. How many understands the enemy has a plan also? You and I are here the Bible says that Jesus came not to where we can cope with the enemy or do all that. It says what? He came to destroy the works of the enemy. He came to destroy the works of the enemy. How many knows that the battle was won 2,000 years ago on the cross? That's why Jesus said what? Jesus said, it is finished. How many of the works already done? Jesus paid a full price. So I want to give you a backstory here. David was the youngest brother of Jesse's family, and Jesse was the dad, Eliab being the, being the eldest, the oldest, and I was the, I was the baby of my family. And then my dad got remarried and had, a, had another with, with, his, with his wife, and so I'm, I'm still, now there's a half baby, I guess. No, no, he's the full baby, but he's the baby of the family. But I was the original, and I remember being the baby of the family. It has its pros, and it has, it, it has its cons at the same time. Because my older brothers, they used me for the guinea pig. They, um, they all believed, they both believed that they were going to be these pitchers in baseball. Guess who got to be the batter? Sometimes I felt more like the bat because I'd be standing there and I finally got smart enough where I put a football, because all we had was a football helmet. So I put a football helmet on and I'd be there swing, holding the, you know, I was four years younger than my next older brother and my next older brother was five years old. So he, one would catch and one would be the pitcher. And Denver, I, I dreaded these words. My oldest brother, Denver, say, here comes the curveball. Oh, no, not the curveball. Because he never had control of it. It curved one way, and that was always right at me. So anyway, so we went through that, and then they believed they were going to be these professional football players. So guess who got to be the wide receiver? Me. One got to be the quarterback, and the other guy was the defensive guy. So I got smashed all the time. Then in the wintertime, they thought they were going to be professional hockey players. So when the pond would freeze over, I grew up in Stillville, so when the pond would freeze over, we'd go play hockey. And I felt more like the puck most of the time than I did actually playing hockey with me and my baseball, my, I had spikes, I wore baseball spikes. We didn't have skis or not, you know, skates or nothing like that. We just went down there and, it, but you know what? I wouldn't change those things now for anything in the world. The world that I grew up in was so much different than the world is now. And when I look around our nation, and I want to talk about three different areas today. I want to talk about our nation for just a moment. Then I want to talk to you about your community that you live in. Then I want to talk to you about the individual that you are. You know, I grew up, like I said, very conservative, very just out in the country in Stillville. Grew up on a farm. Um, like I said, I wouldn't change the way that I grew up at all. And I watch our nation today, how much it's changed. And I'm just going to be really honest with you for just a few moments. I went through some times here recently um, just really broken hearted over our nation. But in the beginning stages of it, my broken heartedness was more, kind of, I'll just be honest with you, it was kind of out of the flesh. Because I was really let down in what I saw, not, not just the leader, but just the nation as a whole, the way people treat each other. You know, I grew up in a community where when somebody was hurting, the community helped. No matter who they was, no matter what was going on, we helped. And I went through a stage where I was very frustrated and disappointed and all these things going on. And I'm just like, I'm just going to be honest. And one day, and I, one day I was really speaking to God and I was praying and I said, God, I said, I don't want to die frustrated. And really clear, the Holy Spirit gave me my answer. He said, then don't live frustrated. And it changed my point of view real quick because I thought the only way that I'm not going to live frustrated or die frustrated is if I don't live frustrated. I cannot allow, as a Christian, I, I need, my view needs to be higher than the world's view. 
if the same thing is affecting me and making me feel like what the world feels, then guess what? I'm looking with the wrong set of eyes. Because that means I'm looking with the eyes of my, my physical eyes and not my eyes of faith. I'm going to give you some stuff today, and I'm not, I'm not here to be your cheerleader. You know, I'm not Hans and Franz. I'm not here to pump you up. I know how old some of you are when you giggle like that because you know what that is. But I want, to, I want you to leave here encouraged today that it's not over yet. No matter what the world says, no matter what the enemy says, it's not over till God decides it's over. Church, I believe that not just our nation, but the world, I don't want to just talk about our nation, as, but our nation needs the church to stand up and be the light that we were called to be. Our little local communities are no longer untouched by some of the things that we never dreamed would be in our local communities. Oh, that only happens there, or that only happens there. And you know what's happened? Is we've allowed, we've, we be honest with you, as the church, we put our light. How many remembers a little song growing up? This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. We ain't going to hide it where? Under, you know what the church has done? Whether we like it or not, we've hidden our light underneath the bushel because we don't want to ruffle the feathers of anybody. But see, we look at it wrong. We're not here to ruffle the feathers of anybody. What we are here to do is proclaim the truth. There's a lot of facts that are going on in our world. Don't deny the facts. They are, they are there. But there is a truth that trumps over, that dominates over the facts that are going on around us. Is our world in a mess? Yes, it is. But the truth is that God is still upon the throne. He is still high and lifted up. The, the, the whole thing, just like with me being frustrated, what I did is, to be honest with you, to a certain degree, I took God off the throne because I was looking at what was going on around us and saying, man, we are just, we're, it, we're, it's over and all this. And all of a sudden, when, when the Holy Spirit reminded me, then don't live frustrated. I'm not to live frustrated. I'm supposed to live with joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I can't change things by holding up a sign. I'm not talking about not letting your voice be, but Bible, but even Paul told us what? You can do great things, but if you don't do them in love, guess what you are? You're a clinging symbol. The church has to understand to stand for truth, be bold, but at the same time, we have to do everything that we do in love because it'll never be received if they think it's just purely judgment. And the Bible tells us what? That, that mercy triumphs over judgment. How many is glad we don't all get what we deserve because of what Jesus did? I don't care what the world does. I don't care who they are. We need to remember that, that, that Jesus died for them too as well. Amen? Now over in James, real quick, and I want to read, I didn't give these to Andrea. Like I said, and I feel so sorry for Andrea. I, I just, um, man, I just want to make sure I give what God's got. And I had, like I said, I had a message, and every time I wanted to send her the stuff, I just kept saying, man, it just don't feel right. It just don't feel good. You know, the Bible tells us to do what? To study and show thyself approved. Church, we need the word inside of us. There's never no wrong time to study. There's never a miss of that, but we need the word inside. How many has ever chopped wood? How many has ever just continued to chop wood and never sharpened your ax? Wouldn't that be kind of silly? We've been there. We've done it. We, we think we can just get one more out of it, but come sooner or later, you have to sharpen the ax. When we read the word, that's all we're doing is sharpening our ax. We have to be sharp. We have to be ready. We, it's, the Bible says what? To be ready in season and out of season. And I've served him for 32 years, and I can tell you most of the time, the, the time it comes to me is more out of season than in season. I call this in season this morning. This is where it should be easy to be a Christian at this morning. Amen? Look at your neighbor, unless you're your spouse, and say, it should be easy in here. It should be easy in here to be the church. That's what we come in here. We come in here to what? To lift one another up, to be edified. To just to glorify him, to come together as a body and say, man, you're not in this alone. That's the great thing I love about church is when we come into church, we see other people around us and say, we're not in this fight alone. Amen. God is good. Over in James, and I want to, so we're going to, I'm going to give you just a short backstory for just a moment on this, this, this set of scriptures that I'm reading. How many's ever heard of David before? David's one of my favorite people. And every time I preach, I always say, every time I read something, oh, that's my favorite scripture. Oh, that's my favorite person. I just love the Bible. I do. I love the Bible because it's not just a story. This is truth. This is real. These were people's lives. These were real people. Don't ever just get caught up in the, that the Bible is just another book, that it's just a storybook. It's a book full of stories, yes, but it's not just a storybook. It is truth and it is real. And these people were real people and went through these things. There's a reason why this stuff is in the Bible. 
And I'm watching my wife to make sure, because I get wound up, and she's like, slow down. Easy, boy, easy. So can I get wound up? But, man, God has been so good to me. Even in, even in the days that I felt like I failed God so much, God is still faithful. God has never let me down. So David goes, you know, David's this young man. and um, In the beginning, they, they, uh, Saul had disobeyed and didn't do the right thing. And God told Samuel to go anoint the new king. And he goes, you're going to go to Jesse's house. And so he goes to Jesse's house. And like I said, I'm going to try to abbreviate this as much as I can. I'm watching the clock. And, uh, and I know it's hard, to, it's hard for me to keep you very long because sooner or later the barbecue smell is going to overtake the building. And then there might be an overthrow in here. So we're going to hurry as fast as we can. So David's, you know, so Jesse calls it all the sons in except for David. And Samuel comes in. And I, this goes back to us looking physically or looking through the eyes of faith spiritually. So Samuel comes in to Jesse's house, and here's Eliab. Big, strong, and man, I mean, he had the, he had the physique of a warrior. And Samuel looks at him and goes, this must be the one. And all of a sudden, as he looks at him, God says, that's not the one. He says, see, you look upon the outward, but God says, I look upon the inward. God looks upon the heart. And all of a sudden, Samuel looks at Jesse and goes, Jesse, do you not have any more sons? And I'm sure we've all felt this way. Even, even Jesse, the dad, goes, well, I got one more son. But, you know, he's, he's out there in the back pasture watching just a few sheep. He's just the youngest. And, you know, he's almost making excuses why he didn't call him in the house. And all of a sudden, Samuel goes, bring him in. You think when... um. Maybe when the church here at Owensville got built, do you think the same way that everybody's like, why another church? Why are we doing this? We don't need another church in Owensville. There's a reason and a purpose why God raised this church up. And so he brings, he brings David into the house, and all of a sudden God says, this is the one. Do you know for this, you were born at this time. I don't believe there was any, I don't believe in any accidents. You know, your family may have told you you were an accident. You may have been told you were a mistake or whatever. But I'm here to tell you today that God made no accidents. God makes no mistakes. That you were born. He could have had you born at any time upon this earth, at any, any day, any time. But he chose to have you here today. And this time on the earth, oh, but it's so hard. We were born for hard things. We were made for hard things, church. Because the Bible tells us what? That the battle is not ours. The battle belongs to him. It is his battle. He is our commander and he is our chief. So he goes on and all of a sudden he says, this is the one. And so he anoints him. Samuel anoints David. And the neat thing about this was in all this, he didn't go to be king. You know what he did? He went back to the sheep. And those places where you feel like you're hidden and maybe forgotten sometimes is your greatest growth. See, see, God saw something in David out there watching those few sheep. And we're going to, I'm going to tell you what he saw here in just a little bit. But I want you to realize wherever you're at in life, if you may feel like you're, you may be working at a desk job, you may be a school teacher, you may, and maybe you just think you're just completely forgotten. Maybe, well, you just don't know how old I am. I'm too old. No, you're not. Oh, I'm too young. No, the Bible tells us what? Don't let nobody look upon your youth and tell you that you're too young. You be the example. If there's breath in your lungs today, you're never too old. There's still something that God has for you to do. One thing, I, I'm not, this is not part of, wasn't going to be my message, but I want to throw this out there real quick. The world needs the younger generation of this church, but the world needs what we've learned throughout our years, church. So many times I see people wanting to go back and, they, and, and wanting to be younger than they are. And I, trust me, I've been there, done that. Yesterday I went out and tried to, I went and cut a whole bunch of brush and built fence and see I got whacked with a limb and I was going to warn you if you think I'm a little strange, I was going to blame it on the limb that I got hit with yesterday, but trust me, I was born this way. So I, for you that know me, it wouldn't do me any good to try to tell you that story, but if you don't know me, just blame that I got smacked in the head yesterday, okay? So, but there's such a separation and I think it's a separation that we never talk about or deal with. It's a separation, for lack of better wording, between the young and the old. There's been, a, even when we were growing up, it was the same thing. We didn't think our parents understood. We didn't think our parents had anything. My dad died 20 years ago. Be this weekend, Father's Day weekend, 20 years ago, he was killed in a car wreck. 
And I look back at all the things my dad tried to tell me and tried to show me. And if I, I wish he was here today to say, Dad, you know what? You knew some stuff. I needed his wisdom. But I thought I was smart enough without it. The world that we're in tries to separate saying we don't understand Church, we as the church believers and the church body, as we as the older, and I call myself the older, I'm 56 years old, but I'm not, and not that we make them, and I'm going to get into this in a moment, not that we make them look like we did, but to be there, to give them wisdom, to encourage, to get them across the finish line. Amen? How many wants to finish the, fin- how many wants to cross the finish line? How many wants to hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into your rest? Nothing else would matter. What we did here would mean nothing if we don't get those words when we finish this race. Paul Paul said, I've I've fought the good fight. I've ran the race. Now my time is done. So anyway, so David goes on. So here we go. Now we're, we're, I'm going to fast forward into where we're at right now. So there's a, there's a giant named Goliath. How many has got some Goliaths in your life? How many believes that Owensville has got some Goliaths in the community? How many believes our nation has some Goliaths that need to come down? In our lives, we have, it may, it may be your health, it may be, it may be your finances, it may be your marriage, it may be your children, there may be a lot of different things, but we all have a Goliath that seems so big, that seems so much bigger than we are. But I want to speak into you today for just a few moments, and I'm going to read James real quick. James 1, 2 through 4 says this. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. How many would like to know that you could go through life without lacking anything? How many knows that Jesus is the answer? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the lie? We all have questions. We all got things that we need, but how many knows there's only one answer? See, sometimes we go looking for all these different answers when at the end of the day, all we need is Jesus. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. There's a place in the Bible that talks about, and I won't jump over there right now. I'm not just give you a moment of this before we see what goes on here. Uh, in Numbers, this is where the Israelites were going into the promised land. And if you've never, if you've never read that part of the Bible, it's where they, they sent out all these spies to go look into the land. And only two came back with a good report. Caleb and Joshua, and all the rest of them said, man, and I think we can look in our, at, at places and we see all this good stuff, and they were looking at this, they were going, look at this bunch of grapes, they're so big that two men can carry a cluster of grapes. And I was laughing this morning because I was talking, thinking about all these scriptures, and it talks about the land's flowing with milk and honey, and I go into the restroom to wash my hands, and the, shamp- or the soap is milk and honey. I was like, oh, that's cool, that's cool right there. Ain't it funny how we make everything spiritual when we try to make like, oh, that's confirmation right there. The hand soap is milk and honey. We're on the right track this morning. And they come back. Caleb and Joshua's like, let's go take the land. But the rest of them said, oh, all this is good, but there's giants in the land. And they, they didn't go do what they were supposed to do And God looked at, God told Moses, he said, here's the thing. They went in for 40 days. And God, because of their unbelief, God says, you're now going to walk through the wilderness for 40 years, one one year for every day that they were in the land. Church, we ain't got time to wander for 40 years. We don't have time for unbelief to be in the church saying, I don't know if we can do this. It's time for the church to stand up and be a Joshua and a Caleb and saying, you know what, let's go take the land. Church, we need to take Owensville for the kingdom of God. There's giants that need to come down that have had strongholds in this, in this area for a long, long time that need to come down. Our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through him of pulling down strongholds. So here we are back on the battlefield now. And it's really neat because for 40 days, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that God uses to get our attention to realize there's something going on. So the 40 days that they were in the land spying it out, God says, because of your unbelief, now you're going to wander for 40 years. And that's a generation because he says, none of you that doubted are going to go into the promised land. The only two going in is Caleb and Joshua. And I'm like, I don't want to be one of those that do all this great stuff, but live in doubt and don't get to enter in. So he goes on to say, so all of a sudden, here's, here we are. I'm going to jump back into this story real quick. Here we are on the, on the battlefield. And here's, here's a Goliath. He's looking at the Israelites and he's saying, 
He, he's, he's defaming the name of God. Do we, do we not live in a world that points fingers at God and says he don't exist and who is this? And, he, and they, they began to try to just tear down the belief of who God is or that he even exists. So you know, Goliath they're saying all this stuff and I love this because Jesse calls David out of the field and how many knows that God likes to set us up sometimes? Sometimes what looks so odd, it's just a moment that God's trying to get you to the right place at the right time. And I love it because he, because Jesse calls David in. He says, David. And David didn't know exactly what was going on, but he says, David, take this food over to the, to your brothers and them on the, on the, on the battlefield. Go over there and take this food to them. They need it. So David goes over. What David didn't know, see, what everybody else just saw a little shepherd boy, God saw a king because he looked upon the heart because David's heart was different than all the other brothers. And you're going to see this continue on in David's, in David's life. So he goes over there and he takes this food and he uh, gives it to the right people and all of a sudden he hears, he hears Goliath. James told us why. Don't, don't be surprised about all these trials and temptations. Don't be surprised about the giants that are going to confront you in your life whenever you get ready to do something for God. Because the giants have always been there. They just like to show up at that moment to try to hinder you from getting what God's got. So he goes to the battlefield, and all of a sudden, here's, here's Goliath screaming and hollering and doing all this stuff. And David goes, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? More or less, he's saying, why are we just standing here and allowing him to do what he's doing? Church, why is the church just standing around allowing? Why are we not on our faces more? Why are we not on our, I mean, just on our face, crying out to God, saying, God, change our nation. So he goes, he goes well, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Why is he doing this to our God? And why is somebody not doing something about it? And all of a sudden, David says, well, you know what? I'll do something about it. And that goes back into the story all of a sudden. And that's why he, when he shows up, see, church, a lot of people around you will kind of show you good intentions. I mean, here's all the warriors. They're warriors. They're true warriors. They've been to war. They've been in the battle. Will I, will I have feedback if I come down on the floor? I can't stand up here any longer. I'm going, I'm going down in here. I'm going down to the battlefield now. And for you in the back, you probably can't see me. I'm still here. See my hand? Um, so David goes out and he says, who is this? And all of a sudden, his, his older brother... Eliab, the one that got bypassed, says, I see your heart. No, he can't. What he sees is his own heart because he's afraid to go fight the giant. But see, what happens is, church, when we begin to step out and begin to do things that no one else has ever done, they're going to say, who do you think you are? What makes you, who gives you the right to do the things that you're wanting to do? And David's answer was, you know what? He goes and talks to King Saul. He says, Saul... And even Saul told him, he said, you're not, you're not a warrior. You've never even been in a battle. You don't even have a sword. You don't have all this stuff. And what he's doing is he's trying to make him look like what their mind of a warrior was. See, what happens in the church world today is all the other churches, and nothing wrong with the other churches, don't get me wrong, but if we're going to be like the church down the street, let's save God some money on electric and go join the church down the street. We've never done it this way before. That's, that's, the, that's the worst words a church could ever say. Is we, we are not going to do it because we've never done it that way before. The Bible says that God's mercies are new and fresh every day. I believe we serve the most creative God on the face of the earth. And He is continually, He's never stopped creating. What this community needs, God's ready to create something to show us how to get, reach these people that are here. So He goes over there and Saul's going, David, you know, you're, you're just a boy. You're all these things. And I love but. I, and here's the thing, he says, but Saul, let me tell you a couple stories real quick. See, David knew where his strength was. His strength was not in what he had physically. It was what was within him. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. If God be for us, who can be against us? So, so David goes, Saul, let me tell you a story. When I was watching, and here goes back to those few sheep that no one ever knew of this stuff about that, what David did while he was watching those few sheep. Because even his older brother, Eliab, asked him again, he says, where's those few sheep that you've been watching? So you're not important enough to have a big flock. you just got a few sheep. But I love what he told what he, when he began to talk to um, uh, 
saw about it. He goes, here's the deal. He goes, you know, when I was watching those sheep, I remember the day when a bear came and grabbed one of the lambs. He says, but I also remember the day that I slew the bear and took the lamb out of its mouth. I remember the day when a lion came, took one of the lambs. And I also remember the day, though, when I slew the lion and took the lamb out of its mouth. Church, we need to wake up because there, the, I believe there's people that are in the mouth of the enemy right now that he's waiting to steal, kill, and destroy. It's time for you and I to stand up and say, let them go because they don't belong to you. They belong to God. You may have children. Don't let the enemy steal your children. They don't belong to him. Don't let the enemy steal your marriage. It doesn't belong to him. He's an ex-employee that got fired. He had his place in heaven one time, but he thought he was better than God. He thought he could overthrow heaven. And you know what? God says, well, you know what? You're done. <laughs> he has no rights, church. The only power he has is the power that we give him. He was rendered powerless 2,000 years ago by what Jesus did on the cross. And see, David knew when he went to that battlefield, he was reminded of what God had done in the past. See, no one else knew those things, but David did. No one else knew the heart of David, but God did. Don't let nobody tell you you can't do what God's told you you can do. The world didn't give it. Don't let the world take it away from you. If you're a born-again Christian child of God, you belong to him and no one else. And God will go before you and make a way where there seems to be no way. Grace City, Owensville, when you begin to go, you're going to blaze new trails. You're going to go into territory that no one's ever went in before. And you're going to go in and we're going to take those, we're going to take those people and those lambs out of the mouths of the enemy and say, no, they don't belong to you. They belong to the kingdom of God. Come on, church. We got to, we're going to have to get really serious about what we're doing here because we're just allowing it to just go by. I'm just going to make, wait till Jesus comes back. We've waited too long, church. Our, what did Jesus say? He says, I'm about my father's business. It's about time for you and I to get about our father's business. And the father's business is saving souls bringing people into the kingdom of God. The Bible says there's two ways of doing that at times. It says, one, you can love them into the kingdom, and two, you can jerk them out of the flame, out of the gates, right out from the gates of hell. There's, there's people that are going to be in that place where it's not going to be pretty when we go get them. Amen? There's going to be people that their hearts are just re really tender and ready to go, and it might just be a song that makes them fall upon their face before God saying, God, I need you. I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That's what we're here for, church. Oh, so I don't forget again. Happy Father's Day. Anyway, but I, this is the best Father's Day gift ever because I want you to know that you have a Father in heaven. No matter what, if you're good, if, if, even for me, I've failed as a dad. But man, I'm sure, I'm sure happy that I serve a good, good father. Says, But you know what? Quit looking back at all your failures. Let's move forward and see what God has to do in the future. You can't get into your future by living in your past, church. It's time to shut that door. See, the enemy wants to remind you of all the things that you failed at. But I'm telling you what, there's only one reason why we have a right, and that's because of what Jesus did upon the cross. Anyway, back into my story. I'm surprised my wife hasn't given me the old fishing pole about reel it back in, buddy. Reel it back in. Here we go. So David's on the, on the battlefield, and he says, you know, who is this? And Eliab's trying to tear him down. Eliab... If he had listened to Eliab, he'd have missed his destiny. He would have missed his calling if he'd, have, if he'd have listened to the people that was around him. Everybody was saying, what are you doing here? What are you doing? You know, you're not this. Even Saul tried to put this armor on David. He says, here, take my sword. Take my, take my armor. And I could just see David looking like the Christmas story. How many ever seen the Christmas story where the kid gets all wrapped up? Ooh, ooh. You know, that's why I envision. You just have to go with me. So remember, I got hit in the head, so go, go with me. Um, but David says, I can't do this. I've never used this before. And I love this. D David knew his weapon. Church, you need to know your weapon. Our praise and worship team are not just a music team. The one that plays that piano, that's her weapon. The one that holds that guitar, that's his weapon. The one that holds that microphone, that's their weapon. Whether, you, whether we realize it or not, because even in the Bible it talks about sending the musicians out before the warriors. 
And it confuses the enemy because, see, the enemy don't understand. How can they praise God? How can they do all this stuff? Don't they see all the stuff that's going on around them? Don't they see how bad everything is? But they don't look at the bad. We look at the good because of who we serve. And so David goes on to say, never mind, take all this stuff. And um, he goes, I love, in the Bible it says he went to, um, and he collected five smooth stones. David goes and collects what he's got. He's got a slingshot called a slingshot. He takes five stones. And he steps out on the battlefield. And I love it. Goliath goes, am I a dog? Put it this way. They say Goliath was over nine foot tall. They said his spearhead weighed 15 pounds. The spear was around 125 pounds. It says it was the, it was the size of a weaver's beam. So it was big. David, I mean, Saul was big. And Daniel, or little, Goliath was big. So here's this young man. He steps out and here's Goliath. All this stuff around him. And he says, am I a dog? He goes, come over here. He goes, today I'll feed your flesh to the birds. And I love it because David's like, you think? You feeling lucky? Because in his heart, David's going, get ready. Here I come. I love this. It says David, the minute that happened, David began to run towards the enemy. Church, it's time for the church to run into these battles and say, no, no. This is not your battleground. This is mine. You, you were defeated 2,000 years ago. No matter what it looks like, no matter what giant is in your life, I don't care if it's sickness. The Bible says by his stripes we are healed. If it's your finances, we can go into this thing. He says by, you know, that he'll supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. You can find, us, find the promises of God. They're, they talk about the promised land. We are still walking into the promises of God because this Bible is full of promises of what he promises if we stand fast to those things. Those are the words of God. Amen? How many believes that the Bible is really the word of God? So David goes, and I love this. It says as David ran towards Goliath, he reaches in to grab a small, to grab a stone. He's running. He ain't stopping. And it says he took it, and when he threw it, it took the giant down. It says the giant fell face first. And I love the ones, one there. David says, today I'm going to take your head. <laughs> Told the giant, I'm going to take your head. How would he do that? He don't even have a, he don't have a sword. He don't have anything. The neat thing is when the, when the enemy went down, see what the enemy means for harm? God will turn it around and use it for your good. See, the enemy meant for his harm. He was going to take that sword. Guess what happened with the sword? David took the sword and took the head of the giant off. No matter what, no weapon that's formed against us shall prosper, church. It's not saying there's not going to be weapons. It's not saying there's not going to be battles. It's not saying any of these things, but the bottom line is, Read the back of the book. We win, church. We win. So David goes over and, get, and he, gets the, he gets, takes the head of that, of, of Goliath, and he holds it up, and, and it's really neat because then all the church got, or I say all the church, all the rest of the warriors, all the rest of the army got really excited. Church, I believe that one thing God wants to use Grace City for over here is I, want, I believe when, when giants begin to fall, you guys are going to be the light. I say you, we are going to be the light. You're going to be the spark that sets the other churches on fire saying, wait a minute, if they can do it, we can do it too. See, God's no respecter of persons. But I truly believe that he set Grace City up over here to be that light upon a hill. That giants begin to come down. That loved ones begin to come home. Prodigal children begin to come home. We begin to see healings take place. And we're not seeking just the miracles. We're seeking Jesus. And they're going to say, man, whenever you seek that, this is, the, this is what we get. Amen? He is the gift. Don't seek the gift. Seek the gift giver. Jesus above everything else. David knew who Jesus was. David knew who God was. Over here in Hebrews, I'm going to get ready to close just a moment. I believe that we, um, you know, the Bible says in Hebrews, talking about a great cloud of witnesses that's cheering us on. And this is just my, but I, I could see as David probably ran across that battlefield. You see him go, go get him, David. Go get him. Show him who's boss. I believe God's cheering us on today saying, come on. The race isn't over yet. If you feel like you've dropped the baton, Get back in the race. You're not disqualified. 
all the failures that you think you've done, all the things that you've missed, and maybe even the calling of God that was on your life, and you feel like you've put it on the back burner, I'm telling you what, church, get in the race. How about we leave the church better than it was when we came into it? Let's leave the church. Let's set it there. I believe the embers are here. I believe there's a, there's a flame. Let's begin to let the Holy Spirit breathe on that flame and turn it into a great, great fire. And let's, let's, let's let Owensville see Grace City for what it is. It's a church that's hungry after God. And the only way Grace City will be hungry is if we're hungry for it. Let's run to the battle. Let's hear God saying, come on, you can go get it. Corey, keep running. Keep running. Don't grow weary in well doing. For in due season, he will lift you up. The race isn't over yet, church. The battle's not over. The enemy is not won and he won't win. The only way he'll win is if we just stand on the sideline and let him do whatever he wants to do. I can't help but say this. I believe the, the, the greatest days of our nation is yet ahead because I know the God that we serve. I believe the greatest days of Owensville are still ahead because I know the God that I serve. I know the greatest days of my life are still ahead because I know the God that I serve and whom I believe. See, I'm just simple enough and crazy enough to really believe what the Word of God says. I've tried the other side. I've tried the side of the world. I've, I've tried it. And I, when I first got saved, I, I remember people saying, think I'll ever come back. Come back to what? What is there to go back to? Once you've tasted the goodness of God, how many's ever tasted the goodness of God? How many's ever had God do a miracle in your life? He did it once. He'll do it again, church. God is not finished yet. The race is not over.